All right, and we are back. Welcome back to The Counselor, and I am your host, Sheldon Stovall. Uh, So we're going to do a little bit of maintenance today. I want to catch some of you up that have weren't here for the inception of the show. Uh, The Counselor um, is a show. I'm obviously a trained counselor, um, and the purpose of this show is to start reaching out to the community. Um, quite of us have been shut up in our homes um, for a long time. Some people are still in their homes to this day due to the COVID scare. And so what we're doing here is that we're working to get you to start back communicating. I know it's hard to believe the mass media. It's hard to believe the news. A lot of us don't know what to believe anymore. So some of the topics that we've talked about, like myths and facts about the coronavirus, In the vaccine, Um, there's some other subjects we talked about, Alzheimer's versus dementia, something that goes on in a lot of families and situations where mom or dad are not acting the way that you're used to. And so now you're unfamiliar with what happened. So it's important that you take your time to learn um, about these things or ask questions. So the counselor, uh, which is myself, Um, And a group of others. There are other counselors on the Counseling Network that you haven't seen, but they're in the backgrounds waiting to um, take your call. If you are looking um, to get in some type of therapy, uh, they're waiting to take your call. The subject matter that we talk about um, every day between 10 and 12, um, it's on YouTube, so it's not like a, a network. So you can go to the channels anytime you like and watch the updated So the point of it being live from 10 to 2 is that I am actually here in the office or available at that time where you can actually ask me questions. And if I can't help you, I will find someone else that will. So uh, today we're going to be talking about the signs that your children are on drugs. And I have quite a bit of experience in the counseling field. I worked in detox. I worked in uh, rehab places. Um, So I've actually been involved in quite a bit to kind of understand these. Uh, Most of the kids that come into detox are at 18, starting at 18. We did have a couple 16, 17 year olds that somehow got in the door to get the help they needed because their parents were concerned. But it's usually for anyone from 18 and over. So if you are unsure of what's going on with your child, I want you to stay tuned because this is very important. Um, It seems like there is a distraction going on, in my opinion, in this country. Uh, Fentanyl is taking quite a bit of our young people out. And when I say out, I mean they're dying at 18 and 19 years old. Also, what they call opiates or opioids. So they're overdosing, meaning there's too much in their system, which is calling is causing a disruption. And most likely they're either on their way dying or they're in a, a, a state where they're getting ready to die. They can't come out of their sleep. I'm trying to use layman terms, but they can't come out of their whatever they're under. They're sleeping and you can't wake them up. Um, that's when they're in an overdose state. And so when they're in that situation, what is the question? What do you do? All right. So uh, we're going to go through all that. But what we want to do now is just kind of open up the conversation. So when you see the the videos on YouTube, uh, there's two things you can do. You can comment on the bottom. You can ask a question, which I see quite a few are starting to do. You can ask a question and the counselor or someone from the counselor uh, network, which are all licensed therapists, will reach out to you and speak with you. Um, you can also call into the studio um, during the hours of 10 and 12. Um, get on my calendar if you want to ask me questions about the content of the show. And so ultimately what we want to do is get you all to start talking and kind of start leading you on where you need to go to get the help you need, whether it's for yourself or for a friend or with uh, someone that you love. So uh, the subject matter for today is substance abuse. Um, I have a lot of experience in this um, and I actually have 
said a few times, um, I do know the cure for addiction. Now, what a bold statement. What do you mean the cure? There is a cure for addiction. So we want you all to uh, stay tuned, continue watching, speak out and talk. Because the only way we're going to know how to help you is get you to open up and say something. All right. So once you get on my calendar, right, when you call in or you see the number on the screen or the email, you either email or call or write a comment at the bottom of, of the show that you're watching. And um, they'll put you on my calendar. So you won't be live at that moment when you call, but you will be put on my schedule. And if there is time. Um, between that time and I do have an opening, you are more than welcome to go ahead and join in the conversation. All right. So if anyone is not clear, please let me know. All right. So another thing I just wanted to mention, um, I'm running low on my copies of Where's the Storehouse. This is a book that I wrote quite a while ago, um, and it's very appropriate for this time. Um, quite a people are wrapped up in situations, whether it's religion, where they're in doctrines and they're in organizations that the preacher may not be what he says he is or what she says she is. And where's a storehouse really helps you start to identify and recognize if you're in a church or an organization that says they're nonprofit, but they're for profit. Meaning it looks like, you know, a church setting. It sounds like it with the good music and the organs and the choir singing, everyone clapping. It looks it, it sounds it, but there's something missing. And what's missing is your knowledge of what you're in. So a lot of people want to sit there and say, who haven't read this? Oh, you're against the church. No, I'm not. What I want to do is encourage you to figure out where you're at. And if you need to just pay someone's salary to get up and preach to you for 15 minutes every week and to play one song and, uh, you know, this in a two hour offering, if that's what you would like to pay for, then you have every right to do that. But if you're in an organization and they're calling it tithing, which many people believe in, um, that, you know, they want to give their 10 percent to God or to the ministry to support the ministry. That's wonderful. And if they're doing that, that's great. But if it's a business organization, um, it may not turn out the way you think it's going to turn out. And so some of the biggest issues that people have had with me um, after they've read this, and I'm talking about some of these church leaders, mostly 90 percent, 99 percent of them were church leaders. Their issue was you can't tell people not to pay tithes. I never told anyone not to pay what I said in this, which is why I want you to pick up a copy, because based on my experience, if it is a business and you call it tithes, you need to let someone know you cannot have people assuming that they're coming to your business and it looks like the part, but this is really what we're doing here is that you guys are paying for my maids. You're paying for my, uh, daily activities, my expense account, my personal account. Uh, we just had another, uh, you know, report coming out. That's a bishop from the AME Zion organization had taken over $14 million uh, from the church and organization. Now, second thing, oh, God will take care of him. We just do what he have to do. So we address that in this as well. We address a lot of the issues, the, a lot of excuses that you want to tell yourself besides facing the truth. And the fact is, it's okay what you're doing. You're just giving it in the wrong place. So hence, where is a storehouse will help you understand what a storehouse is. So when it says bring your tithes into the storehouse and they say that every week, you're going to know where it is. You're going to know what it looks like. And you're going to know what it sounds like. You're going to smell it. You're going to taste it. And you're going to understand better once you pick up a copy. Now, how do you get a copy? So um, you can go to www.amazon.com. Type in my name, Sheldon Lee Stovall. It'll come up. You can place your order. It'll be there within two or three business days. Um, or you can get a signed copy from me. Um, you can pre-order. Um, you can call in to the show. Or you can slide up in my DMs. 
All right. So we just wanted to kind of cover that for you real quick. All right. So this particular subject matter is going to be going for the next month or two, because ultimately this is part of the reason why I have come um, to this platform, because I want to speak with people who are not understanding what's going on when their children are now getting high. All right. So we're going to talk about that. So some of the signs that your children are on drugs, behavior changes. All right. That attitude was bad before, but now it's nasty. They don't listen. They don't come home. We'll talk about that. The behavior begins to change, right? So if they're high that night and I have a microphone on, if they're doing some type of narcotic like uh, cocaine or something, you'll see their mouth moving constantly. It's like they're chewing on a piece of copper. All right. That's one of the signs when someone's using uh, some type of cocaine or substance of that nature, their mouth is constantly moving. Right. And they're looking around. Their eyes are everywhere. Signs when your children are on crystal meth. All right. That's a speed. It's speed. So they're moving fast. They're talking fast. You can't get a word in because they're going, going. They're over here. They're over there. They can't stay still. The more that stuff goes in their system, the longer, the longer they will not go to sleep. So you'll start noticing that your child's been up playing video games for two and three days straight, not eating. And that's the other thing. They're not eating. So a lot of these drugs, they do suppress the appetite. All right. And we're going to get into that when we talk about anorexia a little bit more, because some people who are dealing with, uh, you know, body issues, anorexia, bulimia, their their biggest thing is, oh, I just use a little bit of drugs and I'll be better because I won't make me hungry. Uh, that's not nourishing your body. But we'll talk about that later. All right. So that's that. If they are on opiates. All right. There's a few signs. Uh, and again, I want you guys to comment at the bottom if you have. I don't know everything, but we want to open up this conversation. And if you went through this with your child and, you, you know, the best thing you can do. And if your child passed, the best thing you can do is help someone else instead of just letting everyone just keep falling off this cliff. That seems to be the opiate, the drug cliff. That everybody just keeps falling off of one by one by one by thousands. I mean, these kids, your generation, some of your fathers. Oh, and mothers, are your, the generation is getting cut in high school. Did you think that when you had that child that you die, your child would die over an overdose of fentanyl or opiates? Did you think that? And so this is the issue that we're having as counselors. And even with myself, the parents aren't educated. The parents are allowing these things to go on. Oh, I didn't know. No, you didn't watch for the signs. There are signs to addiction, and we're going to go over that as well. So behavior changes, your child's behavior. They're going to start talking to you any kind of way, talking back, yelling, screaming, because when someone is coming off of opioids, their irritation levels are like through the roof. They're very irritated when they need to use again or when it's wearing out of their body. And the more they use, especially opiates, the more your tolerance starts building and they start, your body becomes physically dependent. So when the body becomes physically dependent, which the opiates are, and that's heroin, um, uh, fentanyl, uh, some of them are drinking morphine. I mean, they're doing it all now. Sucking uh, fentanyl out of uh, pads, gel pads. I mean, you'd be surprised what some of these, or just putting it up their nose uh, and more importantly, putting it in their arms. Which, by the way, I do have an issue, a personal issue with an 18, 17, 19 year old thinking just because you graduated high school that you're now a doctor or nurse that you can literally take a needle and put it in your arm. Or in your friend's arm. Okay. oh, let me do it for you. You are not qualified. And many of you guys, I understand, you know, a lot of you guys go through a lot of things. I've heard a lot of stories in detox because my first question is, why did you start doing this again? 
And so they'll start telling you, oh, I was at a party. I was at a friend's house. You know, we were all just chilling. And, like, some of the older guys were there. And, uh, you know, they, they started shooting up. And they were like, you want to try it? So you're telling me you're just going to just look at someone with a needle in their hand with some kind of juice in it. And most of it, when they're doing it, it's blood. So you're going to look at someone shooting blood back in their arm that just came out and you want to try that? Some of you guys need to start thinking a little bit more. All right. That's ridiculous that you're at 18 years old going to stick a needle directly into your vein. All right. And that's not normally how this thing works. Usually when someone such as the age of 14 or 15 or 16 is introduced to opiates. They might go into their grandma's cabinet or they might be at a party and they're popping pills. Oh, what are y'all doing? Oh, I'll, they'll pop one and try. Ooh, that feels good. And we're going to talk about why that feels good too. All right. That you for fear the feeling that comes out after you use, this, you use a drug or a list of drug or a substance. So we're going to talk about that. But yes, you were, you were at a party. These are her stories I've heard. I was at a party and my friends, you know, they were just, you know, popping pills or whatever. So I did it, you know, we're drinking. Okay, cool. It's not cool, but cool. All right. So why did you do it again? Well, I kind of felt like SHIT. That's what I hear. And so, you know, my friends would give me another one. And so I would feel better. So what do you think is happening when now your body is not feeling better um, because you need an illicit substance that your doctor did not subscribe? So now something's happening to your body. It's changing, right? The way you think is changing because now you need that to feel good every day, especially opiates. All right. So now. It's become, it went from having fun and having a good time with your friends to now you needing to come up with five bucks every day uh, to cover your drug use or drug habit. So at your age of 15, 16, 17, who are you going to go to when you need money? All right. Mom or dad grandma, grandpa, auntie. I mean, you're going to run through the family. So again, behavior changes. All of a sudden they start needing money. They start digging in your purse. When you're not home, you're missing five, you're missing 10, you're missing 15. Okay. You don't think none of it. Oh, they maybe need something. All of a sudden your credit card has two charges for a hundred dollars debits that wasn't there and you didn't do it. Right. Kids are resourceful. They're going to cash up themselves from your credit card. OK, they're going to do things that's going to cause um, you to start noticing signs, signs that maybe my kid might be on drugs. But of course, we're not going to ignore it. Oh, they're only 15. They're innocent. No, they're not. They're not innocent. So that's the part that a lot of you parents need to start thinking about. When your children are out late at night and hanging out with friends that you don't recognize, uh, they're not innocent anymore. When they were innocent, they used to let you talk to their friends on the phone. They used to let you see them. That's not happening anymore. Things that you need to think about. All right. So let's go on. Attitude. So that kind of went to behavior changes. Attitude. Snapping at somebody. Oh, God, help me. I, I can't handle it. Somebody snap. My child snapped at me. Whoa. Right. So my child so snapped at me. You know, you ever see those TikToks and the kid like is talking, they'll say the curse word and, and uh, you know, it's a joke. And then the dad will look and say, what did you just say? And then the kid starts running. Right. So they're innocent at that time. Right. But um, at 15 years old, they say F U B I E, you know what? Hmm. Who? Some of you might be shocked and say, I'm sorry, what did you call me? Now, some parents, I mean, basically, while it's coming out of your mouth, a fist is going straight like 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 a like a bullet. <laughs> now, that's some parents, you know, and some cultures, but some other parents, um, someone like myself as well. You know, I'm going to sit and get shocked for a minute. Like, what did you just say? And try to figure out what's happening. So attitudes change. All right. 
unfamiliar friends. So you start having friends. They start having friends around that you don't that you don't know or recognize. And you're wondering where these friends have come from. And so that's another sign um, of addiction and that your children might be deal- doing some things that they shouldn't be doing when they have unfamiliar friends, older friends. Right. So when they have older friends, OK, um, that you've never seen, your sick, your son is 15, your daughter's 16 and they're and they're hanging out with 19 year olds, picking them up in the car. Think about that for a minute. All right. And start asking questions. All right. Staying out late. For the last time, I'm going to say this because I've said this in so many of my meetings um, that, you know, for me, it's repetitious. But you guys might have heard this once. Excuse me. For the last time, there is nothing good going out after midnight or at dark when it's dark. (coughs) Stores are closed. Um, Places that, you know, they can usually have recreation. Those places are closed. So what are they doing late at night? So staying out late is a definite sign. Stealing. Right. Right. We're not going to call it stealing because these are our children. Oh, no, my child would never do that. I trust my child implicitly. And you did when it was your child. Now that is someone who is using drugs. So we're going to we talk about something called primal survival, where some of the survival techniques kick in. So, yes. So there's stealing. They're reaching in your purse. You're leaving money out like you normally do. You're not paying any attention. And all of a sudden, it's gone. Where did I lose that? I know I had 100 here somewhere. You know, the first thing you're not going to think, why would my child steal from me? They get anything they want. It's not that they're doing something wrong. They're now having to support a habit that they cannot afford. I want some of you um, older people who've kind of been through this and are familiar with how you started. I want you guys to comment. I want you also to call in. It's very important that you guys start looking back and teaching the young, right? And part of my cure addiction, which I'm going to be talking about, is going back to the origin. When did this start happening and why are you still doing it? I, th- I think you guys have mentioned it, uh, heard me mention this a few times that, uh, you know, you make a decision when you're 15 that should not dictate the rest of your life. And when I work with some of these young people in our substance abuse addiction groups and our online groups, um, a lot of us, w- w- a lot of the older ones, when they start talking about when they start it, that's the first thing I say. So basically, you're 35 years old. You shot up for the first time at 21 or 15, and you're still doing it at 35? Are you still getting the same feeling? What is it that has attached you to this decision? Because a lot of this has to do with decision making. And at 15, you don't know any enough to make a decision that's going to affect you for the rest of your life. So, I want you guys who are listening at the sound of my voice, if you don't feel comfortable talking on camera or over the phone or doing a video chat, lots of guys, I did the child support last week and they refused. They wanted me to get a voice augmentator so that their voice wouldn't be recognized because they were afraid that if their girlfriend or ex-wife heard them, they might take them to court again. So I want you, some of you that have, you know, are open with, what happened to you and either if you're still struggling or if you want to talk with someone uh, that who could be struggling to reach out and help, please send some comments out for us. Let us let people read it. We do have people. We have viewers. We have subscribers. You can take a look at the uh, channel. This show is being watched every day. And so I want you guys and I want you to encourage you to open up because that's what this show is all about. All right. So deleting calls in their phone. So that's another thing when, you know, usually when someone's on their phone, I'm talking about these fresh relationship too. We're going to be getting into that lately, uh, later. 
when they're you know when they're on their phone when you first you know see someone with their phone like your kids you know they show you oh this and they'll show you that they'll show you different programs and things like that right they'll show oh look at mom look at this on tiktok right and their phone's not locked and all of a sudden you know you turn around they're hiding in their room all day you know you oh can i use your phone for a minute why why do you want my phone why not i'm paying for it right stand up to it find out what's going on okay i'm not saying this is every person who's deleting calls because we know about that with even other things with relationships when you got to keep deleting calls which you're hiding so when they're deleting calls, there's a reason why they're deleting numbers. Take a picture, okay? And then don't say anything. Confront it after and say, well, who's this? What do you mean? Oh, that's not in my phone. Show them evidence. You have to confront this thing. <clears throat> because if you don't confront it, um, you're not going to be able to deal with it when it gets out of hand. All right? And then the other thing is unusual marks on their face and body, Okay? So some of the signs when someone uh, is on crystal meth or tweaking, as they say, is they start picking their face. They're picking their face. They just keep picking it. All of a sudden you see all these scabs growing all around their face. All right. They're picking their face. You know, part of that. So some people, when they have a tweak or they tweak on whatever drug, they do certain things. Like some people start feeling the table, you know, feeling around. They don't know why they're doing that. You know, remember, drugs are a mind altering substance. So that person is not themselves. Their, their mind is not at full capacity of what it was prior to them using. So when someone is on drugs and you start seeing things like this and picking, right, their physical appearance starts uh, changing. And we often make a joke about crack couples. And I don't know if anybody ever met or seen a crack couple. But, uh, you know, the guy is walking down the street with his shirt off and basically his arms are about this big and his shoulders are are connecting, you know. And then, you know, the, the girlfriend or whoever, you know, so skinny, the clothes falling off and they and they they just think they're the cutest things in the world. And we call them crack ups. So when they're getting unusually skinny and, you know, you see in a six pack and then you see in a rib cage and then you're seeing their lungs start moving and you see their liver start shaking, uh, twitching. There's something going on. I don't think that they're just thin. And I'm going to fight that it's anorexia. All right. Because one thing about illicit drugs, you lose a lot of weight. It's taking it's taking things out of your body, like the salts and, you know, things like that. Things are coming out of your body because you're, you know, obviously you're putting substances in and causing different reactions. Everyone has different reactions. And we're going to talk about science addictions and physical appearance. So, but I just want to kind of get this going. And I want to encourage you guys to pick up the phone. Give us a call. The number is scrolling down on the screen. Or you can also... Uh, email me at promo at the counselor dot live. Um, please leave a comment, whether you agree with me or not. Do you like the shininess of my forehead? Um, why do you wear that same jacket every day? I mean, say something. Let us know that you're interested in the content. And more importantly, stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Counselor, and I'm your host, Sheldon Stovall. So today, we're going to continue on with our uh, discussion on substance abuse, and I want to begin with uh, where we left off on, I believe it was part two of Signs of Addiction. Um, I think uh, we talked a little bit about loss over control of the use as one of uh, the signs. Uh, another one is risky use. Uh, we have the physical effects. So there's some physical issues that do happen uh, when you're using and also social or occupational problems. So let's dig right in. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just quickly mention uh, that my book is currently available. It's called Where is the Storehouse? Um, you can find it on Amazon.com. You can pretty much find it, find it everywhere. Barnes and Nobles. Um, 
So it's pretty much very popular. We're getting ready to try to get it into libraries as well. Um, nationwide for anybody that just cannot afford a copy. Um, and we want to also let you know we're going to be doing virtual book signings every week. So every week I will be available. I believe that it's going to be on a Saturday morning um, where you can actually go into a virtual meeting that's already set up for every Saturday. And once you enter the group, um, there's no purchase necessary. Um, all you would need to do is give me your name, um, and then you can either email me right then, or if you want to just have me forward it to an address, uh, however you like to have it done, uh, but we will send you a personal and signed copy of my book, uh, Where's the Storehouse? Um, and we're also going to be going over it. Uh, very soon but it's going to be very difficult to do it if you don't have a copy or if you haven't read anything or if you're not familiar with the material all right and i did explain it a few times and i'll explain it again uh warehouse where is a storehouse is a depiction it's a nonfiction, and we talk about um how quite a few people um have been manipulated there's testimonies in there by churches or business organizations um, that formulate and look like churches. Believe it or not, just because someone is in a suit um, and can stand in a certain spot or has one of those pulpit things there or whatever they do, does that make mean that they're actually really a genuine church? So what Where the Storehouse does for readers is kind of educate you on what to expect. What are you looking for? And do some research, do some homework, find out if it is a legit church, uh, go to the Secretary, Secretary of State website. They should be, uh, be established. They should have an uh, EIN number, um, but many things um, are in here to help you start identifying where you are. There's so many people suffering, just giving money away every week, believing that something is going to happen for them and nothing does. And it's not because... You know, you don't have the faith. It's because you're putting it in the wrong place. So Warehouse to Storehouse will actually help you figure out if that place is appropriate for you. All right. So thank you very much. And those of you who have purchased, thank you very much. I only have a few copies left. As you can see on my desk, I had a pile a couple weeks ago. So they're moving. Um, more importantly, thank you guys for subscribing to my show. Uh, the counselor, I am so enamored. I'm so excited. I'm so happy that you guys are letting us know that you want to be a part of this great national discussion um, that's so much needed. And who else to lead it but the counselor? All right. So. We talked about uh, what is addiction, and we had asked you guys to leave an answer. Is it a disease or a choice? And so I'm starting to see some comments on there. I haven't really reviewed everything yet. Um, don't worry. We get back to you. If I don't, one of the other licensed counselors will. Um, but, yes, thank you guys for your comments. Um, so I'm going to let you know that addiction is a disease, <clears throat> involving continued use of a substance despite serious substance related problems um, these problems can consist of anything uh, like loss of control over use like i mentioned uh, which when we talk about loss of control over substance use uh, we talk about someone using more of a substance than intended so let's think back again, because we always go back to the origin. That's how we resolve these issues, right? Uh, other counselors can agree. You have to know what happened in the beginning in order you know how to make it an end, right? So um, when you're thinking about loss of use or control of use of a substance, people have difficulty using, and sometimes they use more than what is intended. So... When you find yourself in a predicament where hubby went out on Friday night, drank a little bit too much, ended up uh, out of his mind, blacked out, and went spent the rent money on crack. Or when you find yourself scraping for one more dollar at the liquor store just to get one more nip on, on the street corner asking people for quarters. Or if you find yourself overdosing, Right. Because you don't know what you're doing. Uh, 
typically that's what's going on. Uh, people don't know what they're doing. You're not a doctor and you're injecting uh, medications that are not intended to be uh, at that level of strength inside of your body all at once. You know, I, I really, really have a big problem with the entire concept of how people are sticking a needle in their arm or in their leg or in their neck um, or in the back of their neck or under their toenails and all these other things um, to get a euphoric feeling and you're not a medical doctor or a nurse. And then what really surprises me is that there are children, children, graduating from high school or barely graduating from high school, putting needles in each other's arm just to get a you know, euphoric feeling. So I want to remind you guys that there comes to a time when you first start using, you know, when you're meeting your friends, and I always mention it's 14, 15, 16, and as an experienced counselor, and if you talk to other counselors, they'll say the same thing. Uh, these people start very young, Right. And you start out with your friends and they give you a little bag and, oh, here, try this. Oh, thank you. And you go after drinking and, oh, have a sip of mine. Oh, have some of mine. Oh, hit my crack. Oh, take a sip of my, um, take a snort of my cocaine, right? So that, that's how it usually starts, right? Everybody's having fun with their friends, right? And then all of a sudden, when people start running out of money or if you don't have any money, uh, those friends are no longer there. So again, now, you're using the substance more and you probably most most likely are now physically addicted to whatever drug is of your choice. So it's you start having difficulty reducing the use of the substance. You don't want to stop like you want more and more and more. And we're going to talk about that tonight of why you want so much more. All right. Significant time spent obtaining, using or recovering from the substance. So uh, as a former detox counselor, I can say that uh, for the most part, a lot of people, when they come in after they have drank so much, alcohol levels are at like the peak um, in their blood. Uh, that they're sleeping they or they're having trouble sleeping or they're sleeping for a day or two. If someone's coming off the crystal meth, my gosh, uh, anybody who worked in detox would know that person, good God, they're asleep for three days and there's so much air coming out of you nowhere. Sometimes we would go, oh, okay, you need, we need to go speak with this client. I would open the door, would knock, almost knock me out. All those farts and poots. <laughs> It's a lot coming out because you're pulling in a lot of that smoke in you. And so, yes, they're sleeping for three days. And then they can't walk because their legs are tight. They're numb. They're sore. There are issues that happen when you are recovering from a substance. Anybody ever have a hangover? Oh, it's the most painful, most annoying, most aggravating experience that anyone doesn't want to deal with. And then some people, of course, you'll tell you, oh, I never have a hangover. Well, I'm glad for you. All right. So uh, there are issues when you are using or overusing and then the time spent obtaining and purchasing and using. And I'm not going to go there today, but quite a bit of you guys know that when you get that check or, you know, whenever you're waiting for that deposited check on the first or wherever you're beginning your using time or when you get paid and, you know, some people get direct deposit the night, uh, you know, they get out of work on Thursday and you get paid on Fridays, you get it, you know, around 12 or one at deposits I'm talking to you now. So when you have that situation going on, now your your body is going, your anxiety is rising and you don't call the drug dealer or whoever uh, to come deliver the substance of your choice and you find yourself, um, you know, anxiously waiting, right? So I don't know anyone as I often say in my detoxes, uh, classes and groups, I don't know anyone whose drug dealer shows up within five minutes. Usually it's about an hour to two, right? 
So if you're spending a little bit more money, they might get there a little earlier, but usually it's quite a bit. Right. So uh, you spend a lot of time waiting to obtain it. And then there are people who once they get it, you know, again, if they're using it intravenously, um, they have to get the little cup together and there's something they call a burner and they burn the thing and they have to stir it and then suck. I mean, it's a lot of stuff you got to do to get that stuff in your body, right? Um, if you're an alcoholic, it's unfortunate for you, but you can literally open up that nip and pour it straight down as soon as you're at the register. <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of time that you're spending. And then if somebody is drinking and you have an uh, invitation to grandma's or or whoever you need to go to, you got to wait to sober up a little bit before you can go to the dinner. So you're always showing up late, right? So your life begins to change. And then you start having cravings, cravings. And a lot of people don't know what cravings are. I realize that um, when, you know, I am doing any kind of group work or therapy group. A lot of people don't know what cravings are. So there's a strong desire to use a substance. It's strong. It's almost like physical. Like you just, your body, your mind, your brain is thinking about that substance, thinking about that feeling that it gets, you know, when you use. And so, yes, that turns into what we call a craving, which has now become a strong desire in you. Something that you should not have decided to do when you were 15, And that's what our concern is. And that's why I sit here and I'm doing this show and I'm going to take as much time as I can because I am the counselor and we can do that today. You guys are making decisions at 15 and 16 and 17 and 18 and dying before 19. All right. And oh, well, it wasn't me. Not yet. It starts out with one pill that your friend might give you, you know, the little white ones and they have little 10 on them or a little 20 on them or a little uh, 30 on them. And I think they used to have the 80s on them. And I think those are blue, right? The 30s are blue. I can't remember Um, because now they're all pressing with filled with fentanyl and, and, you know, fentanyl's running stuff now. It's ridiculous that you would at 15 and 16 decide to put an illicit substance into your body at that age and think that you're grown enough to handle it. You're not. And what you're going to do is you're going to put your parents and your family down a path that you're not going to be able to live to fix. I wouldn't be sitting here right now If I was not going to explain to you guys in full detail that I have seen people at these ages die, they are not even making it to graduation. And when are you making this decision in school with your cool friends? If your friends were that cool, okay, they wouldn't be doing it either. Okay, and I don't know how they're still alive, because what happens is once you start having cravings, that is the beginning of a long and tedious journey using drugs and alcohol. So I want you guys to give me a call. If you know someone, if you know someone who is you think is using, you're not getting them in trouble, you're saving their life pick up the phone and call we can send you to someone that can help you we can help you or we can just talk with you you don't have to use your name if you know if it's a parent you don't have to mention their name no one's going to attack you no one's going to hurt you what we're going to do is try to help you and possibly get to them to help them You know, I've been doing this for a while. I know how to get through to people and I will sit here on this phone all day. I will turn that camera off. If you want that camera off, I will turn the volume off. If you want the volume off and uh, more importantly, we just want to help you help them. All right. 
All right. So also risky use. What is that? What is risky use? Signs of addiction. Using the substance in situations where it is physically dangerous. I'm going to say this as slow as I possibly can. When you're sticking a dirty or clean needle inside your arm, you are puncturing your veins. It, your veins are not to get uh, supposed to be punctured on a daily basis, five to ten times a day. If you need some kind of medical assistance that requires you to put a needle in your own arm from a from a substance that you purchase off a street corner in an abandoned house, there's something mentally going on that's incorrect and so i want i'm really taking my time because i like i said i'm seeing so many of you guys starting out young doing this not even realizing that there's an end result and there's an end for you you're not going to make it past 19 i'm telling you this because i've seen it and what some of you guys you do, instead of saying, oh, this guy is just crazy or making things up, go to the graveyard. Usually at the graveyard, there's a tomb, right? And in the tomb, you know, I'm sorry, not a tomb, a tombstone. And when you look at the tombstone, it says the day they were born and the day they died. So if you see something that says 2000 born and then you see something that says 2018 died, that means that person was only 18 years old. And I'm not saying every gravesite is filled with people who have uh, overdosed and died of fentanyl. But I can tell you one thing I do know that I don't see as much as I should on the news and on different channels and, and station is a wide worldwide alert that our young teens are dying off of the use of fentanyl. They're sticking it in their arms. They're sucking it out of a, a gel pad. They're uh, smoking it off a piece of foil. They're uh, smoking it on top of marijuana. I mean, this stuff, I don't, it's a white substance. I don't even know what it really is. That's what they're calling it. It's destroying our children. So I want you guys to really think. I want those of you who have lost your children, pick up the phone and call. The number is scrolling right down there. Or email us. Or on the, under this video, write a comment. Say something to help somebody else. Because these kids, it's almost like an ledge. It's almost like it's a mask of kids on a ledge. And somebody, you know, when you're in a big crowd and somebody starts pushing, guess what, everybody over here? They're going to fall. Okay? And it just seems like we're adding more and more and more children, more young people to go pushing them right onto that edge and leaving them there. And then when the next one comes, the next one falls. And when I say fall, I mean dies. This is not funny anymore, kids. It's not funny. I can't even talk to the ones that are already gone because they're gone. Look at my face. They're dead at 19, 18, 17, 16. They're overdosing and dying. So the next time someone gives you a little pill with a number 10 on it, say no. No, thank you, if you're nice like me. No, thank you. Thank you, but no, thank you. And I want you to watch that person in the next six months laid out on the street corner with a needle in their arms. Okay? Risky use, using the substance in situation where it's physically dangerous. Sticky needles in your arm. Okay, snorting up stuff that you don't even know what you're putting in your nose. 
You don't even have it lab tested. Come on, kids. You're smarter than that. You guys think you're the smartest thing in the world at 15. You tell me what to do. I remember my kids tried to tell me what to do at 15. And sometimes I did listen because they are intelligent. Okay, you do know what to do. Then get the lab tested, bro. Sis, get a lab test. Find out what you're using. Like, use some sense. Do you understand when you, if you are by yourself and you overdose, there is nobody there to save you? No one. If you're by yourself right now and stick a needle directly into your arm, okay, you're going to go out. The ten, nine times out of ten, 99% sure, you're going to go right out, which means you're going to pass out because you've injected too much of a medicine that usually fentanyl, from what I understand, is used, you know, with people like with major surgeries where they're like cut down the middle and digging in and scalping here and cutting there. You know, that's a lot of pain. So that's a heightened medicine to help pain. If you guys are struggling with life to this degree that you need to take some fentanyl or some crack or a, a bottle of liquor, and drink it down. We've all been there as adults. We understand that. Talk to someone. Get a counselor. Talk with a counselor. I'm just one. I may not be the best one, but I'm one of many across this country. And you know what? In Massachusetts, I know therapy, if you have mass health, health is covered 100%. Go every week. Speak with your therapist. Talk with your therapist. You know, tell them what's going on. You don't need to shove a needle in your arm to feel better. That's not an option. And it shouldn't be the option. Dangerous use. Physical or psychological problems are caused by continued use of the substance. So guess what? Like I said, this thing is expensive. You start out, your friends are buying, and oh, here, take a bag. Oh, girl, go ahead. Here you go. Right? That's how it starts out. But how does it finish? You're broke. Your grandmother's tired of you. Your dad's done with you. Your mom can't stand you. Your siblings won't talk to you. No one's going to let you live with them. Everybody's throwing you out. You have nothing. The homeless shelter don't even want you. Okay? It gets, it becomes an issue. Now you're close to being suicidal. Now you don't care if you die. Another effect of the use of substance use. Okay, so at some point you have to start recognizing that that you're addicted. And I hate the excuse, I'm an addict. I'm an addict. You are, you you are an addict, and I get that. But you did not have to uh, encourage someone else to be one either. So a lot of people use that excuse all the time. I'm an addict. You know, it's just, it's part of my addict nature. We're going to talk about that. I'm going to explain to you exactly why you're digging into your grandma's purse. I'm going to explain to you exactly why. Right? You're taking your mom's credit card and cash shopping yourself $3,000. I'm going to tell you exactly why you're doing that. So stay tuned to the counselor. All right. Social and occupational problems. So not fulfilling major obligations at work, um, school, or home. So parents... Back to you. How do you know when your children are using drugs? One of it is that they're skipping school because you can't be in school nodding out. Okay? That's a clear sign that they're on some type of opioid when they're sitting up nodding out. Okay? Um, Or if they're fidgety. Fidgety. Can't stop. Can't stop. Remember feeling, doing all this? Clear signs. Very clear. All right. Not going to work. And I mentioned this before. Crystal meth has crept itself up from the East Coast. I mean, the West Coast up to the East Coast. And I lived out there. I know. They they have so many people living in tents. It's sad to see. They call them tent cities. Because one thing about when you use crystal meth is... Uh, you're going to lose your job because, you know, anytime you put that substance in your body, let's start from day one, 
You, you put it in tonight. You're not going to sleep for 24 hours. So then after that 24 hours, you're still using it. You're not going to sleep for another 24 hours. And then if you keep using it, some people go seven to 14 days going. Some people go for a while. When they're going to work, you see them, they're all tweaked out and, you know, talking fast and got a little groove to them. Oh, yeah. California was full of it. I used to laugh. I'm like, oh, God. And when, after someone finished talking to me at work, I'm like, God, how tweaked out are they? You know, <laughs> so, um, you know, it's it's something that happens. And then so what happens is when you go to sleep, finally, um, after you probably have gone through paralysis, meaning out of your out of your noggin. So once you get to that point, once you go to sleep, you're not waking up for three days. I promise you, you will not wake up because your body, your mind, all those nanograms of 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 the dopamine that has increased so much your brain has to come down and when it goes down it goes all the way down and sometimes it goes below what what the levels it should be so the same pleasures that you would get at some point you're not going to get that same pleasure at that point you're going to get it at a lower point because your mind you have no motivation your mind is trying to come back to where it should be right your levels in your brain because what you're doing is you're just increasing the levels of dopamine in your brain. I mean, this is this is not rocket science. All of these drugs, heroin, crack, alcohol, I think all of the levels only go to about 110 to 115 nanograms. You know, it's not a lot. Um, I think crystal meth, I think they go up to about 1,000. So that's, you ever seen somebody tweak, tweaked out on twister meth? It's very, it's, it's, it's scary to see and sad at the same time because they, they're looking at you, their eyes are open, but they can't see you. They're, they're completely blacked out at that point because their mind has just reached a le- The fluids in their mind, their dopamine levels have increased so high that no one's used to that. No one's used to that. Think about it this way. You know, the pleasure, it's the pleasure part. When, when, when you have sex, I think the, the, it goes up to about 50 nan- nanograms, I think, I can't remember exactly. I'll, we'll do a class on that at one point. But it goes about that. So you feel a little bit of pleasure, right? Some of us, it takes about two minutes to get there, and some of us, two hours, right? Hint, hint. Um, so, yes, but well, that's a pleasure feeling, right? And so, you know, when you're getting ready to do it again, whenever, with your wife or husband or whoever, you know, you're gonna, you know you, your mind is looking for that pleasure. But when you're using drugs, that almost doubles, and at 15 years old, okay, having that type of pleasure hit your body, it's unforgettable. You, you can't forget about it because guess what? You just felt so good for the first time in your life. All right? So these, this, is, this is not rocket science. I want you guys to start thinking, making a decision. I've been doing this for a while, and so far... The most people that have been dying are the youngest ones. Overdosing. I can't do it another day. All right. Social problems caused by continued use of substance use. There's a lot of people that have a lot of social issues. You start, uh, you know, thinking, using drugs, your, your brain starts telling you things. Remember, it's mind altering. So now you're not yourself. So, you know, when I smoke uh, crack or when I drink or when I use crystal meth or whatever, you know, I don't want to eat. So now the the drug has turned into something like a diet, uh, like an appetite suppressant for you. Right. Um, So, of course, you're feeling like, you know, people are looking at you and you're feeling self-conscious. And, you know, you're not going to parties like you used to because you want to get high first. So socially, you start backing away. You start separating from other people, all right? But you're a, you're a person, too. If you're using crack today, if you're using alcohol today, if you're using drugs today, if you're on drugs today and you're watching me, pick up the phone and give me a call. You know, I want you to know that you're somebody, too, all right? That's what makes me so concerned and so saddened by this situation is because your self-esteem is the what is is attacked and broken down your self-esteem you no longer feel good about yourself and so what does that do does that encourage you to stop using no you want to do more because you're 
you just want to feel bad. You want you you enjoy that feeling that yes, no one cares about me except for this drug. That drug is now your best friend. Okay, when you wake up in the morning on payday, and the first thing you want to buy is that drug. That's your best friend. Some people don't even date anymore. I asked what a couple kids. I think they were like twenty two in detox. I said, "Do you have a girlfriend?" Because one thing about uh, opiates, and this is not everybody, but quite a few people that use opiates, there's nothing feeling down there in the lower re- Netherlands, the nether regions, we call it. You're not feeling nothing. You're not even feeling it. Okay? So, you know, you you definitely don't have a girlfriend unless you have a girlfriend that's on it. And so both of you are not doing anything but passed out next to each other. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so... You know, that's 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 what happens ultimately at the end of the day, that you start losing interest in relationships. When's the last time you had a relationship? When's the last time you dated, went out to the movies? Because, oh, my God, it's it's fourteen dollars. I can I can use that to buy me another bag. I can get me another another drink with fourteen dollars. When's the last time you done something for yourself? You start you start backing away socially. All right. Decreasing or giving up important social occupational activities. Once again, people aren't playing basketball anymore. Like when by the time they're 18, who love playing? They're not playing any soccer, football, like nothing. You're not going to play tennis. You're not playing racquetball at the club. You know, you're not doing anything. All you want to do is get high. At 18 years old, that's all you want to do. Really? And then you have physical effects. So building tolerance, needing more and more of the substance to achieve the same effect. So now what took one bag that lasted you all day, right? Heroin users, right? Now you need one every three hours just to sustain to not get sick. By the way, just for the record, for those of you who don't know this, you don't have to get sick anymore. And I want you to pick up the phone and give me a call. There are things out there now that can help you sustain. Okay, I promise you, you will not be sick anymore. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I did meet a young man who I hope one day will contact the show who parents were using And he was put on to use as well. And I'll let us tell him, tell his own story, but he never knew the, there were what they call medication assistant treatments for him because all he knew is that when he woke up in the morning, he had to run and get a bag from the drug deal. He had to get the one for the mom and the dad and himself because they were sick. And I said, well, have you ever heard of Suboxone? And he said, no, what's that? So I just want to mention there are medications out there that can help you get off of these drugs and stay off permanently. There is a plan that will help you. But we can't help you if you don't pick up the phone and call. All right, and lastly, experiencing withdrawal. Uh, we all know what withdrawal is. It's physical or psychological symptoms when not using the substance. So when you start feeling, your body starts having like feelings. Um, I guess I can try to give some examples. I don't know everything about withdrawals and I've never had any, but I can say that I know that with alcohol, um, when people are having withdrawals or beginning the stages of withdrawals, they're feeling dry, dry mouth. They're, you know, their skin, very sensitive. Uh, some people who are alcoholics start shaking. Can you hear? You know, we used to say detox. Here, can you hold this sour cream? I need some whipped cream. <laughs> you know, it was funny, but, you know, they, they kind of got the joke. Yeah, the hands are doing this, and you need a drink to calm yourself down, right? Something's going on, right? Uh, with opiates, you are getting what they call sick, meaning their body is feeling like it's hungry. It's feeling like it's not hungry. They're having mixed feelings. Um, 
you know, the agitation, there's a lot of agitation, irritation, um, anger, like, the, you know, withdrawals, it, it, you know, it comes with a lot because your body is looking for that same feeling that you've been giving it. And when you run out of money, when you run out of what you need, then what? All right. And then finally, finally, uh, I just want to talk about uh, just some of the help you can get. I'm not ending this segment, but what I want to do is I want to mention the help that you might get. Um, so there's four different types of addic- addiction treatments. Um, there's individual therapy, um, which again, if you call a counselor, uh, the counselor will help you. They're usually a therapist. They help you um, like change your substance related thoughts. So we talk to you. We try to figure out what's going on. How did this happen? How did you end up in this place? You know, if it's usually an undiagnosed mental health issue, depression, anxiety, you know, some kind of, you know, past trauma. Um, there's a lot of reasons why people want to pick up and self-medicate. Um, there's group therapy, which we do have group therapy here at the counselor. We do telehealth therapy. They're a little bit more exclusive. Um, if you go to my website, um, you can see that there's two type of options. If you become a member of the uh, counseling network um, that you do have access free access to all and any of the therapies you have or anyone um, in your camp or around you so I want you guys to go to my, my website the counselor.live take a look at the options it's very simple for a reason uh, sometimes too much information doesn't help anybody right all right do you have support groups um you know, you meet other peers, people that, have, that are also in recovery, people that have similar stories, similar situations that happened. Um, so you definitely want to participate in any type of social environment that has to deal with uh, substance free uh, use. I'm sorry, free of substance use. So people that are of like mind and don't want to be using. And then medication. So. Uh, this medication is used in specific cases for symptoms management. Um, again, you can go to your doctor or you can go to a detox. You can go to an emergency room and ask, like, is there something medication that can help me to stop using? We call it medication assisted treatment. But ask, ask somebody if you need some help. All right. Uh, so I want you guys to stay with us. We're going to be ta- moving through the substance abuse, like what is addiction, and we're going to start getting into the nitty gritty. Uh, my name is Sheldon. I would love you to uh, call in the show, email me at the counselor at um, sorry promo at the counselor dot live, or you can slide up in my DMs. All right, and welcome back to The Counselor, and I am your host, Sheldon Stovall. So glad to see that you guys are starting to send some comments through. Uh, We started a new thing called Ask the Counselor, uh, in which people can now send an email. Um, They can also call into the show, and you can talk to the counselor. So if you are interested in having a conversation with me, um, if it's about the subject matter that day, um, we can put you on the calendar if there's something open. Uh, but more importantly, we want to hear from you. So make sure you look at the bottom of the screen and give me a call. Uh, you can call our number, which is listed below. You can email me at promo at the counselor dot live or you can slide up in my DMs. OK, so uh, a couple of things. Uh, thanks so much for subscribing. I mean, I didn't realize that this would grow so big in just one month. This is going to mark one month. Uh, that the counselor has been um, public and it's been a great response. So I appreciate you guys and hopefully you're getting more comfortable with me as I'm getting more comfortable with you and we can kind of make this a good experience because I'm going to be here for a while. All right. So today we're going to be talking about surprising facts about addiction. Um, Some things are very surprising because a lot of people don't realize this, but 
Substance abuse has been around for a very long time, and it's generational. It's going from generation to generation to generation. And for some reason, uh, we don't have enough information on it, because if we did, uh, we would do less using and less putting our money in places where it's not benefiting us. We're going to talk about that in a minute because we're going to talk about some money, some numbers. You're going to think about some numbers. How how big is the substance abuse industry? All right, so let's start with the first surprising fact for today. Alcohol is the most abused substance, okay? So the staggering fact about addiction is not really that alcohol is the most abused substance. Um, It's also legal, right? So that alone gives it a greater reach for people to use. So basically, you just need to be 21. Um, You have to be able to learn how to read or know how to read so you can read some of the labels. uh, Because you just, you know, if you walk in a liquor store, there's so many labels. I mean, you can just, you know, you can't just pick a brown bottle or a white bottle and call it a day. You kind of kind of figure got to kind of figure out what you're drinking. Right. So, uh, yes, it's absolutely legal. Right. And it's been legal for a while. Um, in this country at one point in time, it was not legal and, you know, alcohol prohibition that time period. And there were reasons why. Um, so today, um, alcohol is the most used substance because you can walk into a liquor store and get it. And I just want to read some uh, interesting facts uh, that I found uh, by the Nova, it's called the Nova Report. Over half of all American families can trace some history of alcohol use. Okay, over half. While while this sets the scene, generally, how about outright alcohol abuse? So we can think back to grandparents, maybe even great grandparents, when you know grandpa had a little bit too much to drink, and you know things would be a little different in the house. Or if we have a parent or parents that abuse alcohol or over drink. Um, there's also issues with that. So I got a couple quiz questions I want to ask you guys. And if you can guess the answer, let me know. And I often do this in my groups and I'm sure some people that probably are seeing this will definitely know the answer. How much alcohol does it take for you to be drunk? So that's going to be a good quiz question. If you know the answer, I want you to comment below this video, uh, when it comes out. But how much alcohol do you think it takes to for an individual to get drunk? All right, so we're going to leave that for you guys. All right, so as we can see, because alcohol is uh, able to be purchased, right, then you can actually go in and just have to be at the legal limit. So how is it that these kids are getting it? How is it that... Uh, Some of these young kids under 21 are still drinking, drinking and driving, underage drinking, getting arrested. How are they getting it if it is a legal require? It's a requirement that they show their ID and that they must be 21 in this country. So I want you parents to think about that. I've heard many kids mention when we do talk about this in groups uh, that they went right to their parents' liquor cabinet. So parents, if you have a liquor cabinet inside your house, all right, and it's not locked, or if everyone knows where the key is, um, maybe you need to rethink that because a lot of a lot of people and a lot of young people we have talked to and I have talked to and counseled in many sessions, you know, I start asking them, so how are you getting the alcohol? Oh, it's, I just go to my parents' cabinet. They don't even pay attention. They don't even know what's when it's missing. So parents, I want you guys to think about that. All right, so it starts early. Alcohol dependency starts early. And yes, it is a physical addiction. Anyone who is addicted to alcohol, okay, anyone who's addicted to alcohol, all right, you are at risk of becoming addicted to alcohol. It is, after a while, a physical condition. All right. All right. So addiction is 70% addictions 740 billion bill right so addiction tobacco all right um is also addictive as we all know um and it leads the pack to some distance 
exacting a cost of $168 billion in terms of health care alone each year, overall costs rated to a cool about $300 billion. So there are issues when someone becomes addicted to uh, illicit substance. You start having health issues. So when you're having health issues, what comes next with that? You have to go get taken care of. You have to be treated. Whatever is going on in your life at the time, um, the alcohol is only going to increase that health-wise and make it worse. So some people end up, you know, their kidneys start weakening, their liver um, begins to start getting built up, breakdown. Um, there's a lot of physical issues that happen as a result of al- overconsumption of alcohol. And this happens over time. So now what's happening? You're in the doctors all the time because your liver is starting to become damaged. Um, you know, however, so many issues, diabetes, if you're, if you have, diabetes and you're drinking alcohol, you are worsening your condition. All right. So addiction does cause more an increase in medical and health care care costs. All right. Addiction can alter your brain structure. So as well, I'm going to read this so you can read this as well as the obvious financial cost of addiction, to the cost of anyone addicted to a substance can be more dangerous still systematically abuse abusing any substance can cause the way your brain is structured why is this well addictive substances are so hard to put down because using them gives your brain a shot of dopamine and we talked about that a little bit last time it's a a chemical messenger and neurotransmitter that can affect mood right we talked about that a little bit the front portion of your brain houses the reward center, and this area is electrically stimulated by dopamine. So as we talked about it before, and we're actually going to look at a video that I often show my, a, lot of, a lot of my group sessions. Um, it's a YouTube tech talk, and it, he, there's a gentleman that does kind of break down how, um, whether it's heroin or any type of opiate, um, any kind of uh, alcohol, like your dopamine levels in your brain increase, right? Um, so it's almost like you're adding, you know, some dopamine and we call it whatever drug you are, but that's what's happening is you're raising the levels of dopamine per nanogram. And so then after that, that, that's part of your brain that feels pleasure, your reward system. So when that pleasure is being felt, your brain records it. It says, ooh, a new feeling, right? So, oh, I want that again. And so then, boom, you're going to look for that pleasure again, right? And then your brain is going to start continuously looking for that same pleasure, right? Because you don't wake up with that pleasure, right? Natural dopamine happens, as we talked about, if someone is having sex and you feel some type of pleasure, yes, your dopamine your levels have increased. You know, I think about 50 um, nanograms uh, per decimeter, so... Yes, it does increase the pressure. But then I guess when you add an illicit substance like heroin, I think it goes up to like 110. And uh, alcohol, I think it brings you up to like 111. You know, the dopamine levels go up. And I think crystal meth, as we mentioned last time, it brings you all the way up to 1,000. All right? So it's very dangerous to be playing with the dopamine because then all those levels that go up, what happens when something goes up? It has to come down. So it's, it's, you have to be mindful of what you're putting in your body and what are you causing your body to adjust to. All right. Um, so it can start altering your brain substance, your brain structure. Um, so I don't want to get into that too much, but these are just some of the, some of the interesting facts you need to think about. Multiple genes play a part in addiction. So if you started doing any reading about your addiction, you probably, uh, encountered the concept of an addictive gene. And that's been an argument so much, you know, is there an actual addictive gene um, that people are inherit? And when that addictive gene is activated, uh, that's when the brain finds some type of satisfaction. It, it, it feels something that it hasn't felt or, or needed to feel or just wasn't Activated yet. So, example, uh, opiates. Okay, so 
anyone who has an addictive gene and it happens to be anything related to opiates, you take that first uh, opiate pill, that's going to be like some euphoria that you've never experienced before. So it's going to be a feeling that you get and that, and it activates in that addictive gene and that, that once that addictive gene is activated in your brain, now that your brain knows what to look for when it wants pleasure. All right. Um, so just, we just want to, I'm just touching on some of these. I don't want to get too far into them. All right. Co-occurring, co-occurring disorders, addiction and mental illness. Co-occurring disorders involve more than one health condition, which what that means. Uh, generally mental health disorders simultaneously. So the most common entrance of this is substance abuse in tandem with any of the following anxiety. And we talked about this in the beginning. We were talking about uh, substance use. People self-medicate or go get drugs or alcohol. Anything that you see on this back wall behind me is what would be considered an illicit substance. So if someone is dealing with untreated anxiety, meaning you feel anxious a lot, your body has this, this overwhelming feeling that you can't, you don't realize why it's feeling like that. That could be your anxiety, or some people call it butterflies in your stomach, or some people, you know, just look up some of the symptoms, uh, physical symptoms of anxiety. So when that starts happening, all right, when that's being untreated, what do you, most people take medications, right? So if you have high anxiety, you know, your psychiatrist would probably suggest that you take some type of um, anxiety medication to help you deal with your anxiety, right? Um, to regulate it. Um, so if you're not listening to your psychiatrist, if you don't believe in taking medicine, the anxiety, that doesn't mean anxiety isn't going to go away, right? Uh, even if some Christians, you know, you want to pray it away. Okay, that's great. You can use your faith and however to handle whatever situations, but that anxiety, if not treated, you're going to begin to self-medicate. Okay, and self-medication for anxiety are as follows. Alcohol, all right, opiates, heroin, fentanyl, anything that's going to calm your mood down, right? Some kind of, not, not a, a stimulant, something that's going to uh, relax you, right? So that's why people turn to street drugs, we call them, because um, you're dealing with untreated um, mental illness or mental health, mental illness, all right, OCD, that's a big one, PTSD, right, post-traumatic stress, a lot of people always mention, I got PTSD for this, PTSD for that, PTSD is very serious, and it's a part of your, it's part, your brain remembers a particular part of a trauma that um, you can't really let go yet, um, and it's not, if it's not treated, Right. It's going to cause well, every time it comes up, you're going to want to try to get rid of that memory. You're going to try to get rid of that feeling. And how do you do that? Right. Have a little bit of drink. That'll make you feel better. Right. Uh, let me just take this pill with the number 20 on it. Maybe that might help. Oh, actually, let me just uh, break it down first. Put it in a line and sniff it up my nose. Right. That's what people there. That's their their plan to deal with whatever trauma or past trauma that they don't want to deal with, right? You want those feelings to go away. And one thing we all know about drugs, right, and alcohol, it's not a permanent fix. After you run out of money, after you run out of alcohol, when you're on your last drop and the liquor stores are all open and you took your last sip um, from the last bottle, nip bottle that's at the end of the bed that you forgot about, when that's all gone, guess what? These problems are still there. And so what we want to do is we want to, as counselors, as people that work with helping people, we want you guys to start identifying why is it that you're turning to self-medication and why does it have to be such a dangerous choice? And again, when you're 14, 15, and 16, and 17, and you're going through your life life growing lessons 
and it becomes tumultuous, right, for you. All right. So turning to drugs could be an option, but it doesn't need to be the option. And one thing I want you guys to start learning, and I'm talking to the 15, 16, 17, 18 year olds and 19 year olds, because that's who my audience is right now. When you guys, I want you guys to start learning a few things. You're going to have to learn to cope in life sometime. It may not be a quick fix all the time. So sometimes you might need to learn to cope. Okay. And coping is the best way to deal with life when you cope. All right. So um, remember, we're just learning here today. And again, if some of you find yourself when we're talking about these subjects that it's kind of hitting home, I want you to pick up the phone and I want you to call uh, the counselor network. We are available. We have trained professionals that we can uh, send you over to right away. We can connect you live. Um, we can get the, the professionals on the phone with you. Um, so there are people to help you. And this show is here to kind of encourage you guys to kind of step out, get out of your shell and start talking because many of you are dying. And I'm going to keep saying this as long as I'm talking about substance abuse. Many of you are dying by the day. And, you know, again, when I worked in detox, you know, we would see certain couples come in, you know, the 18, 19 are coming in, getting themselves better. And then all of a sudden we wouldn't see these couples anymore. And so as counselors, we're thinking, oh, they must have done better. And then some of the patients say, no, that's not what happened to them. They're dead. What do you mean they're dead? They just left here a week ago. Detox I'm talking about. Yeah, because guess what happens when you go detox your body? When you detox your body from whatever alcohol or drug you're on, what happens is your tolerance levels for that drug, and we talked about that the other day, tolerance, meaning your body can start you taking more and more. The more of the substance you take in, the more your body wants to handle. And so your tolerance level becomes higher. But when you go to detox, right, and you get clean, your tolerance levels go all the way down to zero, and so when you want to stick that whole amount into the needle again that you was doing when you, before you got to detox, that got you there from your overdose, right? When you want to stick that whole thing in you, what do you think is going to happen? You're going to go out immediately. You're going to go back into an overdose, and you might have a lesser chance this time of waking up. All right, so I want you guys to start thinking about it. Even alcoholics, same thing. You cannot drink 17 bottles, 17 nips or a sleeve, they call it, right? You can't drink all, how many, 12? There's 12 in a sleeve. You can't drink 12, okay? Go to detox as you're shaking like this when you walk in the door, right? And then when you walk out, go right to the liquor store and drink another 12. What's going to happen to you? All right, your tolerance level is lower now. So you have to start thinking about what the consequences are for your actions. And again, I want to say that there is a cure of addiction in my series is coming out very soon. Um, and we're going to be talking about pre-ordering copies, but there is a cure for this addiction. First of all, you need to go back to the origin. When did you start drinking? When did you start using opiates? When did you start smoking crack? When did you start using all these lists of substances? And most of you say the same thing I started using when I was 15 or 16. And so what I'm saying to you is for you to make a decision at 15 that now you're 39 still dealing with, there's something wrong with that. And that has to do with mental illness. All right. So it's important that you adults now start thinking about that. And the issues with your mental illness. All right. Another thing, depression. Huge, huge. A lot of people, there are so many people depressed. And just think of after this horrific pandemic episode of the coronavirus, one and two and three hit America and the world more than two years ago, almost now. Many people have lost relatives, <clears throat> family members. You lost children, 
right? You lost coworkers and loved ones. So depression is something that you guys are going to start dealing with as well. And if you're not dealing with it or never dealt with it, you're going to need professional help. All right. So that's why I want to say if some of these things we're talking about are hitting you or hitting home, give us a call. Call the number below. Um, you will reach. You may not reach me right away. You might talk to someone in staff. Um, you can send me, email me, um, or you can text me on my DMs on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram. There's a way to reach the counselor in every social network and aspect. And if this is just a start, you just reach your hand out and extend. We're going to extend our hand back to you and help you out as well. All right. So please give us a chance. Uh, to help you and help or maybe someone around you. All right, number six. These are surprising facts that we're talking about now. Americans consume 80% of all prescription pills globally. I'm not going to touch that. I lived in L.A. and Hollywood for a long time, and I've never seen so many people with so many bottles of pills in their purses. I mean, in their car glove compartment. I mean, I'm like, what do you need a pill for? Like how many pills can go in your body in your body at one time? So yes, I agree with that. Many Americans assume a lot of pills. I mean, these are and as we have learned, right? Have as we have learned with this entire opioid epidemic that's still lingering, right? Some of these prescription drugs that were supposed to go come from our doctors, people made a lot of money from that. So we're going to talk about that at one point, too, of this whole origin of this opiate epidemic, because it's been going on for quite a while and it's not talked about like it should be. It should be talked about it a lot more because people are still getting their hands on these pills and they're still dying and they're overdosing. So there's something that's that's being looked over still to this day, and I guarantee it has to do with money. All right. Prescription drugs have a higher fertility rate than illegal drugs. So I'm going to read this. Continuing the prescription drug path, it might surprise you to know that legal pills kill more people than illegal drugs. Cocaine, heroin, and crystal meth overdoses tend to grab those headlines. But over the decade to 2010, 48,000 American women died from opiate overdoses um and this is this uh, article is a little bit dated because that number has uh, quadrupled all right people were using these opiates opiate drugs at, at one point but again they're physically they become physically addictive and everybody's body is different so what affects you right away may not affect someone else or what affects you quicker may not affect someone as quickly Right. So you need to think about that when you're taking or listen to your friends about what's available versus what's not available. If somebody can pop an 80, congratulations. When I say an 80, I mean, that's the uh, opiate. So if someone can pop an 80, right, that's 80 milligrams of opiate substance. If someone can put that in their mouth and swallow it, more power to them. That is dangerous. Um, as I don't know what, for someone to just put an 80 milligram of, of, of fentanyl or, or uh, oxycotton, I think it is oxycodone, into their body. It's very dangerous. Your body has to break that down. Okay, it's going to go through a liver, and that's a lot to process. And I see some of these rap videos and some of these kids, oh, I'm popping 80s and all these other things they're saying. And I get that you're making money and becoming relevant, but people are actually taking that seriously. It's unfortunate for me. I, you know, I got into rap a little bit later and a little bit, I mean, like, like maybe last week or a month ago. Um, and I started listening more because I'm trying to figure out what the message is. Cause there is a message coming out in these, from these rappers. They're, they're communicating with us, but we need to understand what's being said. Um, and I often say that, like I said, we do a lot of music therapy and we read songs, um, especially in, in addiction treatment that talk about how people overcame. So sometimes the cure for addiction can be in music as well. Right. Just learning and listening. 
Um, so I said that to say that a lot of times people think it's cool to do drugs. It's not cool to do drugs or to drink, especially when you're a minor, meaning you're under the age. There's a reason why there's a, an age limit. All right. All right, so we're going to finish these uh, surprising facts. I got two more. Most addicts work for a living. That is true. And a lot of people start out, okay, um, with the regular, typical. You know, after work, they'll go out to the, with their friends for happy hour at 5 o'clock and have a drink, okay? And pretty soon, that becomes what you do to relax yourself is have a drink or do whatever drug you of your choice, right? That becomes your relaxation scale. That becomes part of your normal. And so after a while, like I said, this develops in people at different stages. After a while, one drink, you won't feel anything anymore. And so now when you typically just order one glass of wine, now you're ordering two glass of wines at dinner. All right. And then, again, how much does it take for a person to be drunk? How much alcohol does it take for someone to get drunk? I want you guys to put that answer, because I have the answer, but I want to hear what you guys have to have to say. How much alcohol does it take for someone to get drunk? You'll be surprised. All right. So most addicts work for a living, right? So let's talk about that. Think about the stereotype of an addict, okay? A homeless, unemployed bum, right? Crack addicts creating mayhem on the trails um, for their next rock. Meth hags clustered around a park bench and smokers spending all day in a weed cloud having opted out of society, right? So it's very lonely when you're an addict. And usually if someone spends most of their day looking for drugs, then they're obviously not working, right? Which means they can't afford it, so they have to come up with ways to get it, uh, which leads to crime, and we'll talk about that at some point. These all make for a far better news story than a gamefully employed man being heading off to work in the morning, even though he's struggling under the pressing weight of drug addiction. So according to SAMHSA, three quarters of all people with a drinking or drug problem are employed. Of course. I mean, that's that's how these things are sustaining, because most people that that can't afford a drug problem are usually someone who's homeless. Right. Who can't afford drugs that are out there holding signs or, you know, asking people for change or, you know, asking family. You know, you run out of family when you're an addict. Right. So it's important that we understand addiction respects no boundaries and happens regardless of background or income level. So are you telling me that rich and wealthy people can be addicts too? Yes. Yes. Quite a few of them. You know, they have, again, I lived in California for a long time. They have some of the most exclusive uh, rehab centers that you would ever even, you couldn't even imagine who's there because you have to pay a hundred thousand dollars a month just to attend. And even when you do get there, um, t- nine times out of 10, you're not going to see anybody. All right. So it's important that you pay attention to what's going on, uh, in regards to, uh, pulling yourself together. This can happen at any level. And lastly, heroin was once perfectly legal. So while rightly vilified today, heroin was once not only legal, but marked as non-addictive. So that was part of medicine. Um, Back in the 1800s, it was part of medicine. All right. So I want you guys, um, if anything, any of the subject matter has, um, you know, moved you in any way, um, if you feel or you know someone that may be needing some help, I want you to pick up the phone, give us a call. Um, you can email us, you can uh, call the number below, or you can slide up in my DM.
Good afternoon and welcome back to The Counselor. And I am your host, Sheldon Stovall. Uh, thanks so much for tuning in. I'm noticing that subscribers are building. Uh, my audience is building. And we're going to be continuing sing, continue our conversation about substance abuse. Um, and we have someone here that would like to share their story. How are you today? Hi, my name is Jim Wan. I'm out of East Hampton, Mass. And uh, I've been using... Uh, Heavy drugs for the last four months in a bus accident. Okay. And I am clean now. Wow, congratulations. So how long how long have you been clean? I've been clean about a month. About a month, yeah. okay. Mm-hmm. All right. So um, I, as you know, we're talking about substance abuse. Yes. Um, and our audience, as we know, is very young. We have listeners and watchers are between 18 and 24. Yeah. And so part of the reason why we're doing this is we want to kind of educate them on the mistakes that we've made. Sure, because this stuff... Uh, uh, anything I can do to help. Correct. I will talk. About. So when did you get started? Like when did you, what, what age were you when you first began I using? I think I was 11, fifth grade when I first started smoking pot. Okay. And then, uh, and then uh, later on, I just smoked pot. I had a few Heinekens here and there, like 13, 14. So 13, 14. How did you get it? How did you get the drinks? Uh, very easy. Uh, one of my friends, uh, he was 14 years old. He looked old enough. They gave him, he got a fake ID, and he'd go to a package store where they'd serve him. So, yeah. yeah. So, and, uh, it's that easy, right? Yeah. Okay. And then 15, 16, I found women and booze, and uh, I ran with it. And you were lost in it from then? Yeah. And uh, I wasn't doing heavy drugs then. I was drinking a lot. I was drinking a lot of wine, a lot of a lot of beer. Okay. And um, in 1983, I had a bad car accident because I was drunk. I had okay. three cases of beer in the back. Wow. I hit a car head on doing 70 miles an hour in my Mustang. I flipped it end over end, and um, I really uh, got messed up. I hit my face on the steering wheel. Mm. I split my uh, head right open. I was a lot of Blood and uh, brain matter was leaking out on Route 5. Wow. My girlfriend in, who was behind me, she was scalped. They took her scalp off. So they put that back on. It wasn't all the way off, but it was hanging off. So, oh, so you had someone else in the yeah, car when you were drinking I and had, driving. Uh, uh, my f- best friend in the front seat. The transmission came through the floor and broke his leg in three places and broke his arm up here, his shoulder. My. And my cousin, who was in the back seat, grabbed onto him so he wouldn't go through the windshield. Oh, my. And he broke his ankle. Okay. Yeah. So, how old were you around that time? I was seventeen. Okay. Yep. So you began to start using at at thirteen. That was your first. You started using smoking marijuana. Eleven. At eleven. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, you got it from friends, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And then you start at fourteen drinking. You start drinking a little bit here yep. and there. A little bit here and And then it started increasing. You started drinking more and more. And that's because I found women. Yes, <laughs> a lot of a lot of us. Yeah, a lot of us. That's our downfall, right? Yeah. Okay, so as you started progressing, now you're not even 21 yet, no. and you're fully already into alcohol and using drugs. Yeah. So when did you first start using hardcore drugs? Like when uh, did that? I was about 24. And I found uh, cocaine. Cocaine. Okay. I was working 12-hour shifts and uh, three days on, two days off, two days on, three days off. Okay. And I would. Uh, I'd, go, I'd, I'd buy quite a bit, and it was cheap because I knew the guy. Okay. I worked with him. Okay. He was a dealer. Dealer. I'd go over his house, and he'd have a mound of it for a Super Bowl or anything, you know, like maybe a, a half a kilo on the table and just help yourself. Wow. Yeah. And so, obviously, you started growing from there, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, as you move forward throughout your life, now, these decisions you made when you were young and about start using drugs. Yeah. And so what we were talking about before on this a uh, couple of episodes ago is that we make a, a decisions at 15 that determine the rest of our life. Yes, you got to make smart choices right? because I did not. So when you're 15, if you're 15, did you ever thought that right now at your age, you would just now be deciding to become clean? Absolutely not. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that we're, we're working on right now. Yeah. And so if you had a chance to tell some of these younger people that are listening to the show, what would you tell them? At, you know, thinking about it right now at 15, 16. Well, I'll tell 16. you right for one thing. If, uh, if I didn't do drugs and drinking, I'd have that wife, four kids. I'd be living in Maui. I'd be living a nice black beach from the volcano, mm-hmm. ashes, and I'd be set for life. Yes. Because my dad had a garage, and I, and I wanted to go out and drinking with the women instead of working it. Correct. And he sold it. And I, I would be a multimillionaire if I had that garage oh, yeah. right now. Definitely. And like I say, I'd be retired with my girl, Steph, and uh, have four kids. 
I'm living on Maui. Yeah. That's, that's my, that was my dream, and it, it's not going to come true. Instead, I'm living in a camper now. Uh, my friend, I was we had a house uh, with uh, three, uh, two roommates, a couple. Uh, they were both using, yeah. and I didn't. I lived with them for three years. I didn't use anything. Okay. I was uh, smoking a little crack then and here and there, and uh, that was very easy to get. And then I had the bus accident, and my friend Scott said, "Hey, you want to do a little a little ripper?" I did a little ripper, and on my back felt fantastic. A ripper meaning a little bit of heroin. Heroin, which, which okay. Is not heroin. It's Pure fentanyl. Correct. Heroin is black, dark. This stuff is pure white. Correct. Pure fentanyl. Yes, and I'm glad you said that. We were talking about that yesterday. Yep. So we're this substance fentanyl is now kind of running things now. Yep. And I remember it's back in like it look, you know, you look about my age. Um, they were trying to get rid of heroin at one point in this country. Right, you remember, like in the nineteen forties or fifty, they were like trying, to, like they were going after the gangs. Yeah, that's when it was legal, right? Correct, then, correct. Yeah. And now you can't even find heroin anywhere. Yeah, you can't. Yeah. It's gone. Let it's all see. fentanyl now. Let me see. Uh, like twenty years ago, I had a gorgeous girlfriend. Yeah, she wanted to do heroin. We'd go over to uh, uh, Palmer and and get it. Yeah, and it cost a hundred bucks for. For a, 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 a pack, bundle, which, bundle. Which is, or a bundle, yeah, well, pack. I can't even remember. I don't even want. You know, it's, it was ten, yeah. ten bags. Yep, but that was a hundred bucks, and we'd get. I'd get the coke, she'd get the heroin. We'd do speed balls, and that lasted for about three months. I couldn't do it no more because I couldn't sleep. Correct. And I had to work. She didn't. <laughs> she, but she had uh, three kids to raise. Okay. So. Yeah. But um, you know, when I and when I when she went, I quit that like. No problem. Wow. So you let that go. Out. Yep. Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. I had no problem getting off of the heroin. Yeah. But this fentanyl, oh my God, it took me over a month to get to get it out of my system. Correct. So would you end up having to go to detox? Or? No, no, I did. I went over here to clean the slate. Okay. They gave me a uh, uh, um, suboxone. suboxone mm-hmm. and, and they said, oh, you got to come back tomorrow. And take the suboxone. I couldn't even get out of bed. Okay. So I just got up and took the suboxone. It did nothing for me, so I got off by myself. Okay. I, I, That's good. Oh, it was terrible. I had some bags. I'd lick the bags, and it'd make me fall asleep for a couple hours. I'd wake up soaking wet. Yep. Yep. Have to change all my clothes, throw a new sheet on, and that, that'd be two or three nights a week for 35 days. And I got a friend who's been doing it for three years every day, and he's still hung up in his room for three months wow. trying to drag him out Yeah, to, to get back to work. He's a great mechanic. I love the guy to death, and uh, he's just hurting. So you said that you've been cleaned about a month. Yeah. So how did what made you finally decide at 57 to get well, cleaned? Well, actually, I was spending uh, like four or $500 a week on it. You know, it depends. About $1,200, maybe $1,400 a month. Yeah. And that was all profit in my pocket. I was selling cars left and right and, and, and making money. And it's just, and, it just I, and I'm like, this is stupid. Correct. Well, I mean, the stuff, I would do a little one, I, and I didn't do a lot. Yeah. I, did, I didn't overdo it. When I needed the, the, for my back, I would do it. Yeah. You know, I would go whole like like the, my friend. He was going through maybe three thousand, maybe four thousand a month. Yeah, and uh, so you know, I maintained myself. And you do a little one of that fentanyl, and my back felt fine. I come oh. down, do work, yep. no problem. Yeah, and uh, yeah, fent- I mean fentanyl is an a, a pain medication. It's an it's, opiate. It's the devil, right? I'll tell you. It is, but it, dragon, they like they Asian dragon or whatever. But I, yeah. I, it, they, it's the doctors, a pain, it's a pain medication. yes, the doctors use it. Say you have a surgery and they have to cut you open. All right. That's going to be very painful for you when you come out mm-hmm. of the, of the surgery. What's the surgery for? No, I'm saying what, that's what people use fentanyl for. The doctors use uh-huh. fentanyl yeah. and oh, with yeah, surgeries yeah. Yeah. And then you go on. after a surgery and yeah. then they'll wean you off from it, yeah. mm-hmm. but that's going to help you with the intense pain. Yeah. So why do people think it's okay to put it in, just, just take it. Random. It makes you. It makes you feel like Superman. I'm Co- telling you. Correct. I mean, I'm off of it now, and yep. I drink a coffee, and I feel the same way. Yep. Correct. So, I mean, you know, but my back is hurting pretty much, and I'm just dealing with it. I'm going and, to therapy. Yep. Uh, I'm taking galvapentin right now, which is non-narcotic. Correct. Yeah, but I'm eating these things like thirty or twenty a day. Yeah. So you're obviously in a lot of pain. 
Yeah. So and so, is your doctor? I mean, do you are, are you going to a doctor? Yeah, I'm I going mean, to the doctor. okay. So, uh, doctor's I have an appointment the twenty first and then the twenty fourth. I'm uh, 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 either he's going to put me on some kind of painkiller or I'm going to have to go through surgery. Okay. You know? What I would suggest, um, if you don't mind, mm-hmm. is do you have a therapist right now or yes, a, clinic, yes, a counselor? But uh, uh, I stopped going to her because she would adjust my back and it hurt worse. Than if I if she just left it alone, so she says I'm beyond repair. Oh, I'm sorry, a substance abuse counselor. Do you no, you no, have no, one? No, no, sorry. All right. So what I would like to do is suggest that you get yourself connected, or if you want to stay for a few minutes, we can connect you with a substance abuse counselor. I've been through AA. Uh, yeah. I've been through substance abuse. I've been through. I, I I had a drunk driving back in 2015. I did five years in prison. Mm-hmm. I did a bunch of programs. I'm done. I'm. I'm you're done. You, I, I, the only thing that you're going to stop. Is it's your choice. If you don't want to stop, you're not gonna. Correct. If you want to stop, you do it because freaking the stuff is the devil. Correct. And so the reason why I would suggest that you get yourself a counselor is because this is a long time that you've been using, right? Since yeah. since thirteen to age fifty seven. So it's a lot of it's in your mind. It's it's how your mind copes with whatever you're dealing with, yeah. right? So now you have to learn how to start coping without using or turning to a substance. Yes, yes. I, so it's going to, it's, go ahead. It's, it's in my head. I will never use that stuff again. Yes. And I, and I'm looking at you and I believe you. You know, if I need somebody, I could call the hotline. Correct. And, uh, and I suggest for younger people to get counseling. Correct. Because, uh, Correct. Uh, 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 they, they, they're going to live a, a life of hell like I have. Yes. Up until 57. Stop now while you're young. Cause yes. That, it's the devil and it's not even worth it. It's not, not even close to worth it. It's not. Nope. And, you know, we do. We did a study when I was in college. Uh, the average person that's on heroin spends a million dollars in three years. And like I, no, I did three, th- no, three months, and, I, and like I say. It, you went through a lot of money. All my profits were going. I, I Correct. Mean, I, I had a hard time paying my rent. I had to borrow $1,000 to pay my rent. Yes. And I'm not going to do that when I can make it. Correct. And so what we want to do is get you set up um, after once this show is completed. Yeah, sure. We want to All sit right. down and talk yeah, with you and get you set up with a counselor. I'll give it a try. Okay, good. Yeah, because yeah. that's what that's what's going to start helping you kind of start dealing with things without the use of drugs. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. I want to say thanks for coming. I appreciate okay, this. I know that uh, it was really hard, but uh, you made it through it. And, yeah, you know, it wasn't that bad.